me uh, introduce our keynote speaker for this conference. Uh, one of the senior archaeologists in the Philippines with specializations in archaeobotany, Pacific archaeology, and Southeast Asian archaeology. His research throughout the Philippines include Palawan, Agusan, Quezon, and Batanes, to name a few. The former director and currently a professor in UP Diliman Archaeological Studies Program. Let us all welcome Dr. Victor J. Paz. Sir Vic. Maraming salamat, um, Liz. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, well, it is so appropriate, and my talk is really about appropriate, appropriation and appropriateness, that our concept of time is very Pinoy. It is very flexible, and, um, and is there, there's nothing wrong with that, really. As long as at the end of the day, we, we do find uh, that uh, we achieve what we came here to achieve, and that is to celebrate uh, and to share ideas uh, within the uh, uh, great general celebration of the 26th anniversary of the Archaeological Studies Program. I am fascinated by the collection of, uh, of papers. I've read all the abstracts, and in my keynote talk, I will um, attempt to join them as uh, as like um, uh, footnotes to to show the para the parallel direction of all the topics to the subject matter that I would like to share uh, in this um, very uh, celebratory um, conference or seminar on um, the anniversary of um, the ASP and the celebration or the commemoration of uh, the coming of the Iberian influence in, um, in the Philippine archipelago. Now, let me see uh, share screen, okay? So um, I was given about 30 minutes. I think I will go beyond that just a bit, but I'll try my best to keep on uh, within the limits, but because the topic and the initial talk that was given by Attorney De Vega was very um, um, exciting and um, inspiring. Um, I might be able to uh, um, <laughs> intentionally go beyond the, the, the set time. So the marching order given to all of us was to see if we can uh, uh, present, demonstrate some resistance, conformity, or a mixture of both. Uh, of the influence of um, the colonial experience or the coming of um, the Western um, cultures in interacting, engaging, uh, dominating in the in these islands for the last 500 years or so or less. Now, my talk is called An Archaeology of the Native Response to Colonial Incursions. It is an attempt to present what we know from archaeology, uh, which is mainly the study of uh, cultural materiality and given a time depth. And the use of archaeology in this talk is also metaphoric and symbolic in giving value to uh, our study of the, of the human past, of our ancestral cultures and our immediate culture as we live it. The, um, talk has three sections. It uh, looks at the archaeology of heritage. I'll give you an example or two. The archaeology of colonial landscape, of, of a colonial landscape, and the archaeology of appropriation of images and objects. And I will attempt to, uh, well, to share or present a, a proposal of how we can look at all of these, especially the last major topic that I've uh, um, underscored. And um, native is a better term for me because I find it more inclusive than indigenous. And in the narrative I'm going to share, you will see why I chose native rather than indigenous uh, because of the very nature of most of the communities through time that, uh, that we know of or we can infer from and uh, and how uh, this interaction 
really uh, will benefit our, our appreciation is more positive if we say that everyone has the opportunity to be a native uh, and there's some um, uh, stricter uh, uh, categorization of qualifications to become an indigenous. The archaeology of heritage, and I will go straight into the bee's nest here. Um, uh, I would like to share uh, my views about the issue about the Limosawa and Butuan, but not from a historical perspective. I will not go against anyone's views or the decision of the National Historical Commission's uh, committee, but I would like to point out something that took place in the process of this uh, commission that the third or fourth one that was created by the state to look into the issue of the first uh, Eastern Mass or the coming of uh, Magellan's um, expedition. And the way I want to look at it is how the entire narrative has taken root, has taken a life of its own, separate from the official narrative of, uh, of the state which uh, legislated back in the 19, mid, mid 50s, the proclamation or, or, the, or the view that the small tiny island of Limasawa was uh, actually the place where Magellan first landed and um, held the first mass and the um, erecting of a cross of conquest. Now, if you go to Limasawa now, there's already the investment of the state, there's a small uh, shrine uh, uh, and a marker, and it will tell you uh, that it is celebrated. And it is in the consciousness of the small community that lives in this tiny island today. And if you listen to the narrative, the narrative is very rich in who, what is the etymology of Limasawa, about the datus, about the many, many wives, about uh, fantastic uh, uh, components or details of this narrative. Very much uh, separate from its uh, any historical uh, sources or basis, but it is as real as any of these official narratives that we know of, which is, of course, based on very flimsy, very, very thin uh, data or information from we have only one source, Pigafetta, and Pigafetta wasn't very uh, uh, precise or the detailed in his description of where Limasawa was. If only he was as detailed in his description of coconuts, right, and 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 uh, the plants surrounding its use, uh, we will not be in such a conundrum uh, regarding where this event took place. Now, if you go to mainland Mindanao, it, it will be a surprise for many, but the passion that the people from uh, present-day Butuan and Mindanao have with their uh, claim that the first mass and the landing of Magellan what happened in uh, the mouth of the Agusan River is based really on a long tradition that that is where it, it took place. So much so that you will find a marker that was erected in, uh, uh, where was this erected again? In 1872. So if the marker was erected in 1872, the narrative has been kicking around for some time. And in the elite of, uh, of that place back in the 19th century, all accepted and understood that the first mass in Magellan's landing took place there. And they were all united. Then one day, in the late uh, 20th century, it was taken, uh, taken away from them. But it was further complicated by the fact that Butuan then was divided. And where the marker is now is a different municipality called Magallanes. And once that took place, there were other claims now where the first mass was. Uh, so there are more, three, more other, three other places where people are arguing that that is where the mass took place. What I'm pointing out here is how it is so easy for the narratives to be transformed, but the passion, the passion behind all of these narratives are hard to quell. It is something that you cannot just uh, take out 
uh, and the more passionate it is, that means it is more rooted in a collective consciousness of some sort in the communities involved. If to, to, tomorrow you take it away from Limasawa Island, th that community will be united and will be passionate and angrily, passionately defending that it be brought back to them. Same way as how it is now happening in Butuan, except again, they are not united in this claim that uh, where exactly this event took place. So this is an archaeology of some sort, and it's an archaeology of trying to get to why this issue never seems to die when there's such a richer history to be told. And but no, this is equal to any other uh, important event or knowledge, larger ones that, that you can present to the people, uh, especially in Butuan. Now, the other, the second point I want to uh, give a um, demonstration example is that how the archaeology of colonial landscapes is very central to the trajectory of uh, our history and our culture today. Uh, I will focus on the effect of the uh, creation of the Pueblos after the uh, conversions and the implementation of the reduction and of course eventually the creation of the plaza complex it has totally transformed the way politics uh, pattern itself in, in the landscape so the settlement patterns was totally transformed from now from hence since the creation of pueblos people were gathered around uh, rather than scattered, rather than f uh, following uh, the, the banks of a river, of a stream, or scattered in the landscapes in the hills, mo most people were gathered into Pueblos. And in the middle of a Pueblo that is uh, formally created, you have a plaza. And from that, that point on, you then will have a reinforcement of the idea of a, a, a pan-authority, uh, like a large tattoo over everyone else in this concept of a king or a queen that's way, back, way away in the, this imagined place called the Iberian Peninsula. And, uh, and this persisted, persisted. The pattern also transformed, shifted the authority from what used to be perhaps uh, settlements created by founding families, uh, founder cultures, you know, this entire phenomenon that we still see up to the day, and uh, focus at the authority on a new set of people. Some of them managed to, to cross over, but a lot of them did not, especially when you have the church uh, uh, very much present in a Pueblo, the church with an actual friar who came somewhere from Europe, most likely in the Iberian Peninsula, or maybe in Nueva, Nueva España or Mexico. Now, uh, this has changed, has a, a massive impact in the, in the consciousness of people, uh, and has created this idea of uh, commonality too, across uh, landscapes, across islands, that wasn't present uh, prior to the creation of, of all of this, uh, social engineering um, um, manifestations. Now, however, it wasn't that uh, simple, as everyone knows, who are historians in this group. Uh, and we will see at, at the get-go, there were Cimarrones. No, there were people who refused to be uh, just placed inside a Pueblo. But the difference now in our view about uh, Taong Labas and Taong Loob, as I did in my own studies, is that uh, the Taong Labas is also the Taong Loob. And as uh, the early study of Ileto did in Chaong, it's every time that you have a crisis in the Loob, in the Pueblo, people tend to go and be out of the Pueblo. So it can be a small crisis, such as uh, you not being uh, able to pay the cedula, or it can be a large crisis, such a pandemic or a 
it, uh, there, there's a um, outbreak of cholera. Huh? Or the Moro or the slave traders came or, or, or there's a threat of them coming and therefore people then become, uh, it's better off for them not to live in the Pueblo. And we see this phenomena again and again and again. During the Second World War, when the Japanese came, this happened. When the Americans came back, this happened. And a more constant, a more constant phenomena of this sort that we see in the history, especially in Southern Tagalog, uh, where it's well studied, that you see uh, the phenomena of the social bandit or the tulisanes, uh, which the Spanish will call, the Americans will call later on the bandit. But the social bandit is not your uh, highway robber, by the, but they are people who, in many ways, um, represents. Uh, the entire phenomenon of the Taong Labas. And one step further to the Taong Labas is when a cluster of people who then create a counter center. Again, Ileto uh, described this in his study of Chaong, but more importantly, even as early as Gironair in, in the mid or early uh, 19th century, already was describing and visited Tapusi or a place that eventually will enter the, the consciousness and the folklore of uh, Southern Tagalog people, especially those living around Laguna Lake. And this is the legendary uh, place where it is a settlement that uh, by all descriptions, were running it almost like a, a commune. And they are people that is spelled out even by Giriner, as people who were escaping or did not like the way Pueblos were run. And so you have this phenomenon that is out there and that it's, it's latch. In the case of uh, the Pusi, people claim it is where uh, the Wawa Dam is now, no? and Pamintian Cave is part of it, and it's just full of folklore. And part of and central to this folklore is the, the Bernardo Carpio folklore. Um, uh, Scalis wrote a very good critical uh, essay on this quite recently in 2018, critical of the way uh, Ileto um, uh, understood or appreciated uh, Tapusi and Pamintian. And, um, and it's uh, worth a read. But my own work in that area has, uh, has shown that uh, when you create a counter center, eventually if it's successful the center will uh, take note and then the center will appropriate it by sending a priest or, or uh, acknowledging it as a new uh, pueblo giving it a new name making it a san or santa or whatever and then uh, giving it a, uh, a church and uh, in laguna you san antonio is a classic case and san antonio is it was a counter center and San Antonio is Antonio is was the founder as the folklore goes and they just put a sand and since it's the beginnings it has been the center of uh, so-called banditry social movements uh, the Katipuna and uh, revolt um, the Papa Isho went there uh, uh, and settled made a base in the outskirts of uh, San Antonio Kailias uh, went there when he was being hunted before he surrendered. Um, Asadillo uh, uh, came from there, uh, another social bandit in 1935. Uh, the the NPA is up to today, uh, uh, considered that area as like a liberated area and very sympathetic to their movement. And up just across in Quezon, is Sampaloc, and Sampaloc has the same history of being a counter center that was incorporated into the Pueblo system eventually, but the consciousness still remains as, as if it is acting like a counter center. So in our, the talks that we'll hear, uh, uh, Torre Campo uh, in the se in se second session, first talk, We'll talk. We'll be. We'll be talking something that I think will have similarities to what I am saying. Now, this phenomena of the of the role of the pueblo and it and and local population engagement 
is again well is a good demonstration of this conflict of this tension of this multi-layered appreciation of the effect of the changing landscape was the 1899 siege of Baler. Baler, as this wonderful drawing show, sketch shows, uh, is, was so rustic, still very provincial, but already had the plaza complex concept being introduced or being um, lived in. And you have the church in the middle, and then you have the siege, and then the eventual negotiation that uh, that allowed for the Spanish soldiers uh, to surrender peacefully uh, and survive this uh, siege. What um, I like about this is precisely uh, it doesn't matter how big or small a settlement is, the effect of the Pueblo as a settlement pattern with a plaza of some sort in the middle uh, has now become the base uh, the baseline in creating settlements, which then has an effect in the way people think about their role and their engagement with the landscape. Two papers are, uh, suppo are I suppose, uh, parallel to this view uh, and this time of history. Uh, Saboy's uh, talk on, on the La Gutaus revolt up in the north and Pingol's uh, talk about uh, Catholicism and Simban. Uh, now, let me uh, share another major point about uh, consciousness and and the effect uh, impact of colonial of the col colonial experience. Um, Tagalogs and Cebuanos in Cebu Island have lost the this ritual of Pangasi, but even as we speak, and these two uh, color pictures will show. It's a picture I, I got from the web of a wedding of the Subanons, uh, quite a uh, um, uh, upper uh, uh, echelon um, family, and um, they still practice pangasi. And pangasi, and pangasi, it's a rice, it's rice beer, rice wine, and um, and as you will see from the black and white pictures, it has been a very old. Uh, Phenomena uh, Christie uh, recorded in the turn of the 20th century, and then in the late 20th century, uh, Robert Fox has recorded it, and I myself have, have seen it still being done by the Tagpanwas, and um, so it's a persisting uh, practice. But it was very central for a long time for most ethno-linguistic groups in the Philippines. But the Tagalogs and the Cebuanos lost it, and I will argue the reason why it. Uh, it disappeared, but it's still in the language. Uh, if you look at Lactao, the dictionary of Lactao, San Buenaventura, you know, the earliest Tagalog Spanish uh, dictionary has it uh, in Tagalog and in Cebuano, is because the Catalonas were uh, completely replaced by the priests. And the Simbahan, Sambahan of the Tagalogs and Cebuanos, was completely replaced by the church. Not just any other church, but the church that I will now further explain has a very important role in the way uh, we appreciate our cosmology and our practice of uh, Roman Catholicism or, or Christianity in the Philippines today. So the Babaylands will be further uh, articulated in the concept of the of the uh, ritual specialists like the Babaylands by uh, Montanar you know, in, in his talk. And CNN Flores, of course, will talk about the uncolonized land of the Cordilleras. This persistence of older cultures with a parallel trajectory, but nevertheless uh, very much pulled within the gravitational trajectory of the impact of the colonial um, interaction. Now, what happened was not an eradication of Pangasi, in my view, for the Tagalogs especially, but a shifting of its value. It still is with us, as I would argue, in especially in Santa Tagalog, in how ritualized drinking is. And, and and all the banters and all, and even now, if you are a drinker, you will have the pangala, you know, the first, uh, as you open a bottle, you throw 
and you ally something no, to things that you don't see. And we will see this uh, at the point of contact, right? In uh, the account of Tigafeta and, uh, and in Cebu and the uh, summary of, of uh, in Scott's Barangay of uh, how Pangasi was drunk in the Visayas. And in both cases, you will see it's a very social event. And now I will argue that in the Tagalogs and maybe the Spanos, that this um, was relegated to practices and the tradition of tagay and, uh, and social drinking. Uh, but the creation or the production of rice beer or rice wine, wine um, was lost totally uh, because it is a very special kind of alcoholic drink. As we see now, up to now, with all the other still existing extant practices from different ethno-linguistic groups from Luzon to Mindanao. So in uh, Reyes's uh, talk about um, 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 archaeomusicology, uh, the connection is very flimsy, but more of how adapt, uh, ind uh, indigenous responses and adaptation of certain practices. Um, but in his case, it will be on uh, a musical instrument. Now, the last major uh, section of my talk is on the archaeology of appropriation of images, objects, and spaces. I've been arguing this for some time and been fine tuning it, polishing it, uh, uh, tweaking it. But I have, a, I have the view that things persist, not because meanings persist and meanings don't change. Meanings are very hard to understand. Uh, because of uh, each individual might have a different take on it. And we're talking about, uh, and the longer and the deeper the time and the wider the time that you're interested in, then it becomes really very difficult to get into meaning, real meaning. But we, there's a persistence, why is that so? And I will argue because there's a collective mind that exists. And this collective mind gets uh, communicated, transmuted, and transformed by uh, neural networking. And neural networking is not a metaphysical argument for transmission of information. It is, in fact, the basic model now, the most uh, prominent model in, um, in artificial intelligence research. And it has been going on. Collective mind and neural networking put together has been articulated by scholars in the past. Most prominent of them all was, of course, Carl Jung. But in Jung's explanation, it's, it's still borderline metaphysical. I like it to call it collective mind and neural networking to uh, distance myself from that, but still acknowledging the uh, wet roots of this kind of thinking to the contributions of, uh, of Carl Jung and company. And therefore, we talk about appropriateness. Things survive, objects persist, symbols persist because they are appropriate to the collective mind of people that are transmitted through a complex uh, neural networking so my classic example will of course be the linglingo something that has been persisting one of the few things that unite uh, <laughs> the archaeology of the region that goes beyond uh, exclusivity they say more inclusive kind of um, artifact assemblage in the region, as I, as I argue. First, the term is ethnographic, comes from uh, uh, Ifugao, comes from the appropriation of an Ifugao term by buyer to an archeological assemblage of objects, of artifacts, which is simply described in my view, you can, you can define it as an object with a hole in the middle and a slit that opens up to the outside. And then its decorations will, will be varied and, and, and diverse. So the oldest forms that we find are these three point ones, the one on the top. And you will see through time, first, it is made from different types of material. And its most uh, contemporary form is the linglingo that most of us are, are very familiar with, without the three points. But it maintains the uh, central hole in a slit that uh, opens it up. 
Now, some of you might think uh, it doesn't look like the three point at all. Okay, okay. But when we look at the bicephalus, the two headed types, we see its earliest form in southern China, in, in Chinese Neolithic. And in its earliest form, it is a bird with a sunburst in the middle uh, and uh, two heads, right, as wings. Now, as it went for, uh, later on to South Southeast Asia, to Vietnam, it uh, became more stylized. And now the, the bird's head is gone. It is replaced by the Ling Ling type of hole. And then you still have the two heads. And then the tail of the bird becomes like a claw of some sort. So it's so confusing what it is. And if you look now at its uh, contemporary expressions in the Cordillera, it is by far, um, it, there's no debate. It is the same form. But if you ask people what it means, well, you, you ask three people, you have three answers, right? You have each individual has a different take on what it means. And in fact, as early as Bayer's ethnography, he could not get to the bottom of its meaning. All he could, all he could uh, conclude, it is a significant object and may present some prestige to the people wearing it, right? Now, so appropriateness is an important concept in my, in my view of persistence of forms uh, because meaning is hard to pin down even with contemporary cultures. And so this is uh, something that uh, is something that we can use to understand patterning in the objects that we find uh, in the archaeology. Take this last example I have of this, some sort, of this sort. We have this wonderful uh, pendant-like uh, shell object covered in red resinous material, uh, fashion, right? using its own natural spiraling it's a corner shell made into, into a disc but deliberately made to look like a sun it's a sunburst and we found this inside a, a jar burial in a site in the Bondo peninsula in katanawan uh, and um, it's 2000 years old so we've dated the site no? and so this is safely 2000 years old now in the same region, and in fact, in the Bonto Peninsula, we will find jar bear uh, votive uh, objects or grave uh, furniture made out of pottery with a sunburst of, uh, motif. And then you have trade bear ceramics, the earliest uh, of sort, so-called Tang Dynasty types, uh, will have the sun, a, a decoration that can easily be interpreted by those who purchase it as a sunburst. And the blue and white uh, decorated wear that definitely is a flower in a vase as created by the artisans back in China, but it doesn't mean that those who purchase it in the Philippines appreciate it as such. They ended up in graves as grave goods. And to my argument, it is no different to the minds, collective mind of people back then to see it as a sunburst. So this sunburst symbol will persist and we will see it very central to authority, to the sense of resistance. It is in the early flags of the Katipuna of the Philippine Revolution and formalized in the formal flag that we have of the Philippine Republic today. And in the amulets uh, and the large and, and more um, uh, substantial amulets that you find being sold now in Capo, uh, you will see that the sunburst is uh, a, a symbol that you will uh, that persist. And of course, whenever someone dies that is uh, um, selfless, you no, know, is considered a hero or or a prestigious member of society, it is draped by the Philippine flag, and definitely it's not conscious but it is so appropriate that you have the sunburst again just like we see its persistence in this kind of form and meaning uh, uh value that meaning in across 
time for the last 2,000 years at least. Huh? And of course, uh, De Vegas, uh, earlier talk, the one that came before, his talk talking about Hari na Matagalog. And in a way, in his talk, in, in very uh, uh, um, disciplined uh, uh, arguments based on documentation, he, in, in a way, was trying to say that um, the, uh, the way we see uh, ourselves as a collective, uh, it, it's Hari is a, is a term, but really more, it has a resonance to uh, consciousness that came before, way before the late 19th century. Now, when Corda Aquino died and Chris Aquino asked his, uh, her, uh, uh, her friend to, to design the, uh, the flatbed of the truck, uh, the person saw it appropriate of all things to make a sunburst uh, of flowers to, uh, um, to border the coffin of Corda Aquino. And I like this picture, especially the right, because the adulation and the response of the people seems to uh, collectively, <laughs> it's just so appropriate that I, I think this is all something that cannot, is not articulated, but it's just the appropriateness that triggers this type of mass reaction. So uh, Makawili's talk later on, on the hermeneutics of Ginhawa, I think it's parallel to this, though, because the response is a response, in many ways, of kaginhawaan, of kaginhawaan, a very important term, as he will explain in his paper later on. Now, in Mindoro, when we were excavating there, we, it was very clear, and that's why nativism, native nativism, is very important, a term rather than uh, indigenous, because the settlements by the coast of Mindoro now and even in the early 20th century are comprised of people who are migrants from Batangas. And so the settlements there have ruins of churches, of early churches that were created by people who were uh, proselytizing you know, uh, the, um, the um, Franciscan uh, recollects, etc., uh, the Jesuits before them, and they were all in ruins. So when you ask them uh, what's the history behind all these ruins, they revert to a folklore because they were not there and their senses were not there when, it, when these churches were being constructed or, or were, use, were usable. And so the folklore goes, uh, it was all created in one night by a giant or a certain a magical person. And then uh, the last one, it was always the last one, and the sun was coming up, so it was incomplete, never finished. No. So in all the three churches that we excavated, that was a recurring uh, pattern in the folklore. Now, the Mangyans were living nearby and in those areas too. And when we excavated in Bungabong, in the Lumbayan there, we found a wonderful artifact uh, from the Mangyans. It's a spindle world and it has a sunburst there. And um, we argue, of course, we argued back then and we argue now uh, that uh, this archaeology in this sense can unite uh, people of different ethnicities, all natives of Mindoro, into the sense of belonging, you know, based on the, on the artifacts and the narratives that we wrap artifacts with, uh, in, in these places that we excavated. Now, the ruins, and this is in Bangkora, are very important. When we came there, we had this notion, at least I did, that, uh, well, you create a Simbang uh, Bato, no, a stone church, only when you have enough population and the Pueblo is rich enough. But th these are not very rich Pueblos from the get-go. These are places where the Jesuits first and then the Recollects were trying to convert people into these new Pueblos. And so they immediately, in the middle of the 19th century, created stone churches, immediately, not wooden churches, stone churches. And this Recollect one in Nauhan, in Bangkoro, is interesting because it, its facade, it has all the symbols of the Franciscans. Uh, so Tabaos, a talk on churches and fortifications across the Kagan Valley is a parallel topic here no, for later. Now, 
and of course uh, uh, Roas talk about the the um, um, slaving raiding etc is also very relevant because like in this case in Bangkoro this was a fortified church it's uh, it's it's windows are are like arrow slit windows it's a fortified and and the accounts of uh, slave raiding uh, are uh, many and well documented for very <laughs> very uh, um, uh, understandable reasons because uh, Mamburao, just on the other side of the island was the base of the Moro raiders for a long time uh, in the 18th century and early 19th century now in the facade, you will see stars, Australias, and, and, and the sun, uh, and the sacred heart, etc., with its sunbursts, etc. And for me, I argue that, and this is a reconstruction of it, uh, that this facade uh, resonated, triggered a collective mind, um, a, a consciousness in the, in the minds of people, which then attracted them to the Pueblo and allowed the maintenance of these Pueblos. And uh, so the reason why they want to make churches made out of stone immediately, they knew there's a correlation, but they, I'm sure they couldn't explain that if you've made them out of stone, people will come and people will become uh, av uh, av uh, very religious uh, members of community. I argue it's because stone churches are like caves and caves were the original uh, some simbahan, sambahan of uh, of many people, even after, uh, even after the coming of the um, Iberians. So, ritual specialists like the Catalonas were replaced by priests. Many people have said that already in the past. Datu houses and caves were replaced by stone churches. Not many people have said that. This is insight that we we, we got out of all of this, and so even the the smell of an old church, of a of a of a stone church smells like a cave because bats like to roost in in these churches and and the sand and the and the atmosphere you no know, and the temperature uh, uh, as opposed to what is outside is always something like you are entering a a cave so appropriateness is not only at the level of those of, of churches, structures, right, and, uh, and uh, sections of society, individual appropriateness is also important. The famous Boxer Codex drawing of Pintados and their tattoos uh, show an appropriateness. Uh, before, when I was a student, and people say that that tattoo, uh, the buttocks is a flower, is of course ridiculous, no? Uh, of course, that's a sunburst. And those geometric lines are not meaningless. They are uh, stylized uh, lines that represent ser um, serpents. And I will show, uh, explain that further later on. Huh? Uh, appropriate Andres Bonifacio, although he was never um, dressed like way or looked like way, a real Andres Bonifacio, but not appropriate, right? Appropriate Manny Pacquiao, right? Uh, not an appropriate Mani Pacquiao. No? So you, you get my point about appropriateness and how people will respond to this type of appropriateness in, at the level of individuals. So um, the way I see it, given time, right, with the point, the zenith of the triangle of time as a present, uh, at any given time, you have a collective mind in a culture. And any given time, you have the general consciousness going on. And they are represented, reflected in material culture at all levels. And then every time this changes, nothing is chetison, nothing is forgotten. They just change meaning. Uh, and so a, a, a former archetype may not be an archetype anymore, but it joins the collective, still in the collective mind. And new archetypes and meaning take place form transform through time and at any given time in the present you will always have a certain set of material culture with meaning and a certain amount of appropriateness and that appropriateness is dictated by its history in the collective mind perhaps most of them were at one time or another archetypes 
of a culture that was surviving, uh, thriving in the same landscape where your culture or where you grew up in. So nothing is, uh, in, in a way, my argument is that they, there, you don't see things in the landscape. You don't, people don't create things out of just arbitrariness. There's always some uh, selection process and that selection process is dictated by a collective mind and conscious, not at the level of the, uh, not conscious at the level of the individual. And so you will see that meaning so persistent in our cultures all across the archipelago, but now Cristobal still central up to now. Uh, caves, certain types of caves are very central up to now, right? And then there are uh, so-called megaliths being uh, created fashion, right? Uh, stone markers uh, in specific areas, isolated places in islands in Batanes, like the one on the top. Stone churches that are really like small hills with caves in them, very meaningful, uh, but resonates very strongly in the collective mind of people. And of course, you have the hybrid of this where caves are uh, transformed, refashioned to be made into actual churches with altars and, and, and pews, etc., for the Christians slash Catholics. So now let me share with you this interpretation of the Guadalupe, no? the Immaculada Concepcion Guadalupe. For those who know, and I'm sure, I'm sure Arsenio Manuel, no, Arsenio Manuel, <laughs> Arsenio Nicolas knows this well. Uh, the Guadalupe uh, is not even a Immaculate Conception that came from the Iberian Peninsula, but came from from Mexico, and in 1531, with the uh, with with the miracle associated with it, it was recognized by the church, and the and as you will see, the iconography of the Guadalupe is not your classic immaculate conception. It doesn't have an orb, and it doesn't have a snake where the the Virgin is uh, stepping on, and yes, it's it has the half moon, fertility symbols that are highly codified, articulated in the literature of Roman Catholicism, right? In its literature. When it came to Mexico, the Guadalupe uh, it doesn't have the orb, but it is an immaculate conception with the sunburst. Now, just as a point, a very contemporary drawing of the immaculate conception uh, highlights the sunburst, doesn't have the orb, doesn't have the half moon, then integrates a a glowing heart, right? A fiery heart. My point here is that people have no problem appropriating the symbol, right? And uh, and modifying it with more or less a general meaning uh, um, intact in their minds. No? Now, when the Guadalupe Immaculate Conception came to the Philippines, you will see a range from the late 19th century, uh, from the late 18th century to the 19th century of its interpretation. You will see uh, in the far left, the, um, the emphasis on the sunburst, right? The, on the next to it, right, is you will see clearly it is uh, East Asian artisan from the face of the Virgin down uh, to its gown, etc. Our friends, uh, Ricky, Jose, and, uh, and Villegas, uh, are very, very uh, detailed in their description of all of this, except they were silent when it came to the half moon. And the reason why they say they're silent, there's nothing to say about it. But if you notice what Zobel would call the informal popular style, the last two ones, it doesn't look like a half moon at all. Not at all, right? It's not because the artist wasn't competent, it just, they didn't see it as a half moon. They saw them as horns. Horns, and that was appropriate. Why? I will get to that. No? But with, concerning this topic, Austria later on will talk about the Brown Madonna in early colonial Tagalog society. This is a parallel topic. And Magpantay on folk Catholicism and syncretisms of major response. Again, a parallel topic to what I'm saying. 
So from Nagaland, from Nagaland to the easternmost edge of South Asia, you will see this uh, this phenomena of a of a person, and then sitting on standing on horns. You go to Taiwan, historically in Yami Island, you will see the Tao Tao and the horns, right? Horns and some of them. This one, the person with the snakes and horns and carabaos represent horns, right? In the Philippines, in the Cordillera, we have it in Bontok, right? The picture from Matterson 97, you have Bontok, Tao Tao with horns, right? Our, picture, our, our trip to Bakung in the western coast of the Cordillera uh, in Benguet, uh, we saw well this amazing burial they it's against this boulder as if trying to create a cave because there are no caves in the area and then housed it you now cave house and then the coffin had a carabao's horn and a tao tao next to it right then we go to Sulawesi and Calder's fantastic work where he documented drew all of these hooks and not only that, he then presented a typology of the hooks and how it has transformed and became more stylized, right, through space and time. We don't know exactly how, how long time and space, but these are the forms of the same concept of a hook with a tao tao, sunburst for some, and, uh, and horns. Ayara Gradio once wore a necklace, right? That exactly is as if it is part of the typology that Calderon wrote uh, did with the hooks, right? But it is, I, I believe, a Christian uh, cross at the moment. So there's <laughs> there's this persistence of form yeah, because of this uh, appropriateness. And then you go to Sumatra, you have this recorded uh, burial uh, wedding um, object of a man of a a person squatting and then um, between two horns and sepik in New Guinea and uh, you have this uh, in a, a person saying standing on a boat looks like horns so my point here it is across the entire landscape and Heine Gelden already noticed this and said look at this what is happening here he didn't give an explanation except it was very clear that there's something very deeply connect, deep connections between all of these motifs. And so it's easy to put in the immaculate conception of this style. And that is why it is so powerful a symbol and so appropriately accepted and embraced by our culture. So we will have a Tao Tao, which now I could argue any uh, monument of Rizal is like a Tao Tao. Now, then you have the phenomenon of the Tao Tao inside caves. And in this case, we see in a site that we've been excavating for the last 10 years in the Devil Valley called Pasimbahan, where there's a natural flowstone. If you look closely, you can see whatever you want to see. It can be an oblation, a, a, a man with a claw, etc. What is important is not the real meaning, but that it was seen as significant. And sometime around a thousand or even over a thousand years ago, it was used as an ostrary. So on top, people were uh, reburying the bones of their loved ones, covered it with red powder ochre, right? And uh, put in a arrowhead and then a metal of metal and then capped it with a slab, right? And then in, in a hole at the bottom, we, uh, there was a uh, trade dress ceramics made out of green with three marbles. We didn't see this, it was just a crown. And ritual specialists, right, were parking or recharging their anting antings there. So uh, necklaces, you know, uh, medallions, uh, wraparounds, etc., were found inside it. And in front of it, someone offered a bent sword uh, and lots of beads in front of this um, flowstone. So it was very meaningful because obviously it looks like a Tao Tao. And so in 1876 in France, the lady, there was this miracle as far as Roman Catholics are concerned in Lourdes. 
and um, saw the Virgin Mary showed up in one of the caverns at Lourdes, and, and we all know its significance to Roman Catholicism. The entire concept came to the Philippines by the Jesuits in their Jesuit house, the Baguio Observatory, in 1913, where a grotto was created, the first grotto of this sort. Within a few years, it was all over the Philippines. Everywhere you go, if you have your middle class, you have a garden, you create a grotto of some sort. And the phenomenon of the grotto is still going on. And then uh, these pictures on the bottom right are from Santa Ana. Uh, you will see that it is not looking, it is not trying or attempting to be like the grotto at Lourdes. It is just consistent with the idea of a tau, of a tau, tau inside a cave. Right, the tau tau inside the cave and um, just to put uh, prove that point just just, just across Rizal's house in Calamba you now the Calamba shrine there's a huge grotto and it's not a Virgin Mary no, I don't know it's just Joseph right with a child a baby and then on another street side grotto in Santa Ana you have more than you don't have the Virgin Mary but a entire pantheon of uh, images uh, that are venerated by the community in a structure that looks like a house, but in collectively, they're thinking also perhaps of a cave uh, indirectly. And in Samar, just to drive my point, you have the classic looking uh, Lourdes type, right? But they put the two, huge extensions of tinapa because this is a store that sells tinapa uh, in um, Kalbayuk summer and the other one is a taklobo a shell that looks like a, that serves like a cave etc so the entire range of expressions but not really connected to lourdes but connected to this persistent appropriate representation of a tao tao in a cave or cavern. So, Nicolas will be, um, Arsenio Nicolas will be giving a talk on uh, resistant conformity and transformation. Uh, and um, this is definitely not uh, the, the exact tra tra trajectory of uh, Arsenio Nicolas' talk, but knowing him, it is parallel in many ways. Uh, uh, so the last example I have is uh, a festival, a festival just before the fiesta in uh, Tuhian in Katanawan in the Bontok Peninsula. And it's been going on, but it, lately it has been um, um, revved up uh, in many ways. They now have a t-shirt back in 2060, the first time, and it, uh, it's a fluvial parade. Uh, they put in their images to be recharged and then they travel outside the cove and then they come back you know? and that's all it is right so the santo nino etc uh my uh, talk later on will uh, talk about uh, something parallel on the pistas and the passing uh now they put in and these are from the very poor com uh, families to the rich ones and they now have a patron and a patron decided to put first an awning you know, for all of these images to rest before they are, um, they are, they go to the boats and then they do the fluvial parade. That's 2016. By 2018, the patron created a structure and notice that it created an arch. Why, why the hell do you put an arch, like a faux arch? Of course, uh, there are many things going on. And then by uh, 2020, the arch, everything, the entire place became like a charging area first, a place where you put all your images, you know, all your saints, etc., before the start of the fluvial parade to be blessed, uh, to be blessed by the priest. So here you have a very recent documented phenomena of how fast meaning can change. This is supposed to be a Santo Nino. Fluvial parade reinvented only as Santo Nino, not really. But in the minds of people, it doesn't really have to be just a Santo Nino. Huh? Uh, so 
it is easy if we are looking at living cultures to look at agents and quiz the agents uh, and then to look at the collective consciousness and then to uh, infer about the collective mind. Unfortunately, as you go further back in time, and in, the, in our case, just a hundred years or even just half a century, we lose a lot of information from the level of the agent and the agent changes its mind. You know, even though it's been documented that the person said it this way, but 10 years after, the person has a different take on it. And so from archaeology and from the past, we, all, we have no agents anymore to interview. And then we, to get to the collective consciousness is difficult, but we can get to the collective mind because of the patterns that we excavate, we notice not only in archaeological context, but also in the cultural living ethnographic context of the cultures that we have. So to summarize, the colonial experience under Spain is just one of several periods in Philippine history that had a lasting impact to our culture. Adaptation and adaptation and integration was inevitable. The colonial experience was not total but substantial enough to change the settlement patterns, the cosmology and its iconography, uh, our polities, and uh, for better or for worse, it has dictated the trajectory of our history. I propose, of course, a system of knowing the past in this manner, looking at the long patterns. The meaning is secondary for me in comparison to the appropriateness and appropriation Eventually, we might get meaning, but um, not at the moment. And of course, uh, question of conformity. Yes, we did conform through the Plaza Complex of Pueblos. Uh, then uh, non resistance, yes, through the town labas, the, the counter centers, you know, and our appropriation of uh, Christianity. And of course, the mixture of both, right? In terms of our cosmology, our worldview, how we adapted and appropriated things that were introduced or try, were attempted to be forced on us by uh, colonial powers. Maraming salamat, and that's all that I want to share. 14 talks to come, very exciting, very wonderful uh, talks to, to look forward to. Maraming salamat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sir Vic. A little reminder to our participants before we move on to the continuation of our session one. We highly encourage everyone to ask your questions even during the, the speaker's presentation. Just input them to the Q&A box or comment section in our Facebook live stream. All your questions, including questions for our keynote speaker, Dr. Paz, will be addressed during the open forum at the end of our session.